In business today, three things to know. First, it's the first Monday in October, and that means it's back in session for the Supreme Court. Balancing the wrongs with your rights. A classic from Schoolhouse Rock. Key cases that impact businesses and workers are on the docket, and already the court made a historic non-decision. Then, she is Germany's Wonder Woman. How Angela Merkel didn't just save the German economy, she may have saved all of Europe with her tough take no prisoners methods. And the greenwashing of America. Are large corporations really working to protect the environment, or is it just a big show for good press? Arise Exchange starts now. Hello everyone, I'm Andrew Schmertz. The market started the first full week of the fourth quarter trading in a rather tight range, but ultimately lower. There is big corporate news, however, today. Tech hardware maker Hewlett Packard says it will split into two companies after its CEO declared victory in turning the company around. That's up for debate, however. HP will split its hardware business, largely personal computers and printers, and its software storage and networking business. Investors eh, seem to like the idea, pushing HP stock higher, closing up a buck 65, nearly 5% to 36.85 today. As for the rest of the markets, they sort of meandered lower. Here are the final numbers. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closing down 17 points to 16,991. The S&P 500 off a fraction. And the Nasdaq down about half a percent to 44.54. And commodities, gold closing up 15.20. A nice little pop for gold after a big sell-off last week. And oil back up over the $90 a barrel range, up 86 cents. The U.S. Supreme Court returned to work Monday with major business cases on the docket this term, but before it made a single ruling, it made a historic non-ruling, or it decided to dodge a ruling, depending on your view. The court declined hearing appeals from five states on the issue of gay marriage. In each of these states, federal appeals courts struck down bans that in effect now legalizes gay marriage in 60% of the country. For a rundown of this and other cases that could impact businesses and workers, we turn to Horace Cooper, senior fellow with the National Center for Public Policy Research. Horace, we're going to start with this sort of gay marriage punt, if you will. Uh, how historic is the decision not to hear these cases, or is it simply that the Supreme Court doesn't want to get involved right now? Um, it's historic in the terms of the impact that uh, their absence uh, or lack of action may be taking. But I really think this is more an example of that judicial modesty that's going to be the hallmark of the Roberts uh, court uh, uh, coverage or tenure, and that is um, He's probably sat down, I think, with Justice Kennedy and said, let's keep her powder dry. We don't mm -hmm. actually have a split in any of the circuits. And until we do, we don't need to take any action. If this gets resolved internally by us taking no action, then maybe at the end of that we can review it. But there's no reason to just jump right into it. And that's something that a lot of people said wouldn't be true of Roberts, said that the Roberts court would be activist. But this, again, as I said, is likely an example of that kind of modesty that he pledged. And so does this set the precedent, basically, if uh, supporters of gay marriage run the table through the circuits, that the Supreme Court then would have little recourse in reviewing it? Well, you could always, uh, because they don't give a reason for why they haven't taken a case, they could always end up taking one of the cases that come forward. Um, I predict that we may likely see something from the Fifth Circuit uh, that would result in a split mm -hmm. requiring the court yeah. to take and action. And that tends to be one of the more conservative circuits that's in the right. nation. All right, let's turn to some of the business cases that the court is going to hear today. Not nearly as exciting, but cases that may have uh, impact on workers as well. Sort of this, and businesses, well, let's talk about this EPA ozone ruling that will leave the 75 per parts billion ozone standard in place uh, for businesses. Many are seeing this as an Obama administration win today. Well, it is an Obama administration win, but it's actually a Bush administration win. <laughs> this actual uh, initiative 
uh, was put forward in the remaining months of the Bush administration. And in fact, a number of environmental groups actually had sued to stop it from going forward. Those suits lost. And when it went into effect, uh, a group of business organizations decided to attack it. And it was the Obama administration that decided it was useful to keep this measure in place. And they asked the court not to overturn the existing lower court ruling. And that's what the court did. OK, and two worker cases coming up. First, there's an Abercrombie and Fitch case where a Muslim job applicant is suing, claiming she didn't get a job because she wasn't able to uh, wear her scarf, and a UPS case where a pregnant woman claims that her physical needs were not met because she was required to hold packages. Tell us about those yeah. cases. The, there are two of those cases, the UPS case and the Abercrombie & Fitch case. In the Abercrombie & Fitch case, the defense that is being presented is that uh, the employer didn't ever find out that there was some a particular accommodation needed and that merely having a discussion internally during the application process or complaining about it after the person wasn't uh, allowed to be hired didn't constitute the kind of notice that would be necessary for an employer to have. If the court rules that any claim by an employee that their, their needs have not been met uh, makes the company strictly liable. That will be a significant big, setback big uh, for employers. All right, Horace Cooper, we're going to hear from you all session long, I am sure. Thank you. Thank you. Late this afternoon, President Obama spoke about combating the surge in Ebola cases in the U.S. The commander in chief says he will put more pressure on the international community to confront the crisis. Meantime, the airlines are facing stepped up anxiety. This past weekend, a plane was detained at Newark after a passenger from West Africa became sick on board. He did not have Ebola, but there is growing concern over the safety of air travel. Russ Amir Amer is a retired United Airlines pilot and the CEO of Aero Consulting Experts. Ross, welcome back to Arise Exchange. Hello, Andrew. How are you? So how should the airlines be reacting to this? And are they going to be able to do this on their own? Or should there be some sort of government oversight here? Well, uh, first of all, Andrew, um, I think this is uh, hysteria. And I'm not sure why this hysteria has been promulgated. Uh, you know, how many people die every day in the U.S. Uh, from a common cold? Yeah, and, and the flu, and also when you're talking about Africa, malaria. You know, we're not doing enough, certainly, to help malaria. So there is hysteria going on. Do, and, and, and do you think any of the protocols, though, are actually realistic, where they're, you know, trying to take temperature of people before they get on board a plane? No, because, you know, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, obviously, flight, flight crews are not... Uh, train to be medical professionals. Mm -hmm. They can't do this. It has to be done by medical professionals if they're truly thinking of uh, doing this kind of uh, screening. Um, TSA people can't do this. So it has to be uh, an ama uh, amazing effort by uh, the pro uh, uh, people that are in charge of health not by airlines or TSA. Ro or Ross, like real that. quickly, do you think we're going to see some travel bans in place? I mean, we banned travel to Tel Aviv for uh, uh, several days when there were rockets being launched. Uh, there's been no action to ban flights. You know, they may do that again out of uh, hysteria because, um, you know, if there's enough pressure and noise in the media, they, they, uh, airlines may do that. Um, I, I don't know, obviously. Uh, we may end up doing that, but again, that's that's not going to stop. Okay, Ross Amer, CEO of Aero Consulting. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Coming up, the fight for representation in the nation's capital, the case for and against Washington statehood. You're watching Arise Exchange. Last week on a rise exchange, Hong Kong protesters faced another night of tear gas as they dig in for a third day of pro-democracy marches. The question is, how far do you go in terms of cracking down? But that's a big risk that the Chinese government takes. Lena Dunham has recruited a series of artists to perform a warm-up act. Despite earning millions, Dunham is paying her warm-up cast 
not. Watch this week for more. Arise Exchange. Welcome back to Arise Exchange. The debate over whether the District of Columbia should become a state has persisted now for more than 200 years. But a growing number of organizations advocating full representation for Washingtonians are putting it back in the spotlight. We have two guests on either side of the issue right now. Kimberly Perry is the executive director of D.C. Vote. And Roger Pilon is with the Cato Institute. A quick note and disclosure. Many years ago, I worked on an ad campaign for D.C. Vote, and I want to let you know about that. Roger, I want to start with you. I read your congressional testimony about why you think that this is just flat-out unconstitutional, that Congress does not have the authorization to do this. Can you work, walk us through that argument in a minute or so? Sure. First argument is that there is no authority under the Constitution to do this. There is the authority to create a district within which the government is seated. This bill that has been proposed would actually reduce the, dis the uh, district to a tiny enclave around the National Mall, essentially, mm -hmm. and then the rest of what is now the District of Columbia would be called New Columbia. And so, there's the first argument. The second argument is that in order to uh, do this, you'd have to get the consent of Maryland. And there's no indication that Maryland would consent on this because one of the sleeping issues is that uh, the district, if it were to become a separate state, would like to but, impose a commuter tax sure, on Maryland. Uh, okay. Well, let me, uh, before I get to Kim, though, but let me ask you the, not the constitutional question, but the policy concern. The district demographics simply are different than it was when it was created. And there's an argument that you've disenfranchised people because they have no representation in Congress. Is there something short of statehood that you would support? Uh, n not, not short of a constitutional amendment. Whether I'm for or against this isn't the issue. The issue is, at bottom, this is going to have to be done through a change in the Constitution. And in the, the idea that the legislature, that Congress can do this by itself, has been visited by every Justice Department since the Kennedy administration, and everyone has found that it's got to be done through a constitutional amendment, except for Obama, and he got a second opinion when his Office of Legal Counsel agreed with the rest of the Justice Departments, so he went to the Solicitor General's office and got one saying otherwise. Yeah, and Kim, Roger, Kim Rogers' point is that this has failed every single time because of some constitutional questions. There was an effort to give Washington one voting member of Congress and in exchange for a voting member from Congress from Utah. Why do you think that this is constitutional and that this should happen now? Listen, there's a couple of things that folks really need to understand that are absolutely pertinent to this, and I'd love to just name a few. One is that nearly a million residents, 650,000 tax-paying citizens who live in the District of Columbia have absolutely no representation uh, in our nation's uh, uh, federal political system. Um, we don't have any representation in the House or the U.S. Senate. D decisions uh, that are important uh, to our country are, are made, and we are not at the table. We don't have a seat. The other two things that folks really don't realize is that C Congress micromanages the District of Columbia uh, because of this authority. So the taxpaying dollars uh, of the District of Columbia residents, uh, that budget has to be approved by Congress every year, to the detriment, really, of both Congress and, so, and the District so of Kim, Columbia. Kim, Kim, and every single, the other piece of it is every single law that's passed by our local leaders priority uh, from our local citizens has to be approved by Congress. There's no other jurisdiction in the country you know, there, there's, there, look, there's that's from a subject policy, from a uh, to this kind of micromanagement. From a policy argument, there's, there's a lot of arguments, obviously, that people have been disenfranchised. Well, why don't you take that case and get a constitutional amendment? There has been a constitutional amendment regarding the district that gave them electoral votes. It's possible. The 23rd Amendment. There, let me say, the second part of this is that I have great respect for Dr. Pilon and obviously for the Constitution. Look, at the time the Constitution was written, uh, I think all of the, all of the founding fathers uh, were white men who were over the age of 21. Um, at the time, the president could serve for as many terms uh, as he could get elected. Well, a lot has changed since then. And the Constitution was designed to be a living, breathing document that was supposed to grow along with the United States. We've seen that as it relates to voting rights, uh, voting rights for women, for African Americans. I stand here as proof <laughs> that we can change and evolve and grow. 
And so we're looking for a solution. The statehood bill that Dr. Pilon responded to, all and each and every one of the points he raised, you know, we can refute. Okay. Clearly, the Constitution can and should be amended and changed. The 23rd Amendment, of course, can be repealed. Roger, what about the constitutional and question? And expanded okay. okay, what, Roger, what about the constitutional question, though, of basic taxation without representation? That the people living in D.C., uh, and you can't really say they can move. I mean, we understand that that's, that's a limit. What about that argument? That isn't a constitutional argument, nor were all of the policy points that Kim just made constitutional arguments. She spoke about the vote being given to the free slaves. She spoke about the vote being given to women. Those were all done through constitutional amendment. Back in 1978, a constitutional amendment was put before the country. During the seven years that it was authorized to, for the states to ratify that, only 16 states had done so. So Roger, this has been tried and it has failed. And finally, though, is there a constitutional argument against, I mean, doesn't Congress have the plenary power to decide congressional representation and at least give Washington that? No, no, that okay. is exactly the problem. The, 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 the legislature has to act on pursuant to the Constitution. You know, this is going to have to take a change uh, guys, guys, in I'm the Constitution. We're, I'm afraid we're there, out of time. There are I'd love scores to have... of other, other constitutional scholars who, who uh, that disagree with Dr. Pallon okay, I... and have written extensively this is not about me this matter alone. to Kim prove Roger, that Congress does have the authority to make this decision. We're out of time. It's a lively debate, one that can't obviously be settled either in five minutes or 200 years. I'd love to have you back on, though, to both, both of you back on to talk about it more in the future. Thank you. Thanks. And time now for our business ticker stories making headlines across the nation and the world. Lawnmowers, guns, cell phone plans, and now health insurance. These are just a few of the things available at your local Walmart. The retailer is partnering with DirectHealth.com, a site to compare insurance plans to allow customers to shop health insurance in Walmart stores. The partnership will bring licensed insurance agents into branches of the nation's largest retailer, even though Walmart will not receive a commission on the sales. The deed for a New York City gem is going over to China. The Wardoff Astoria has been sold for nearly $2 billion to a Chinese insurance company. The hotel group, Hilton Worldwide, announced it would join a strategic partnership, quote unquote, with the Anbang Insurance Group, the new owners of the hotel, for the next 100 years. The two promise a serious renovation to restore the hotel to its, quote, historic grandeur. The rich are getting cheaper, <laughs> at least when it comes to charity. Get this study from the Chronicle of Philanthropy finds that the wealthiest American, those making more than $200,000 a year, gave 4.6% less to charity over the past six years. Meantime, Americans making less than $100,000 a year gave 4.5% more of their incomes, even as their incomes got lower over the same period. She is an inspiration for millions of women and men around the world. She's Angela Merkel, the first female chancellor of Europe and one of the premier architects of the European Union, named by Forbes as one of the most powerful women in the world. Our next guest says her call for Euro responsibility and austerity is one of her greatest achievements. Ivan Eland is with the Independent Institute and a frequent contributor to this program. Ivan, thank you for coming on to talk about Merkel. We've been discussing what she has done on this program since it is launched. Uh, how key has she been, basically, in keeping Europe out of a further disaster because of its financial system? Well, I think she has contributed to that, and her austerity uh, pleas to the, or demands to the other countries who have been just irresponsible. The German people don't want to pay for it, and she's a, she's a mouthpiece for the Germans saying, you know, we're tired of uh, Greece, Portugal, Ireland, uh, you know, the rest of the countries just uh, being really irresponsible. However, I think uh, that said, Merkel hasn't been perfect. Mm -hmm. I mean, she has uh, sort of uh, mediated bailouts to these other countries, uh, but they could have been more severe had she not uh, demanded, you know, austerity for aid. Yeah, and there, and there is some question as to whether the austerity plan is sort of the, the correct one. Do you think the Germans are getting tired of sort of, you know, carrying Europe on their shoulders right now? 
Yeah, I think they are. But I mean, you know, they have to do their own austerity and uh, their own reforms as well. And I think some people in Germany are saying, you know, we can't expect these other countries to do it when we, we have some reforms that we ought to make ourselves. And in fact, uh, Merkel has uh, instituted, you know, the minimum wage and uh, rent controls and things like this that are uh, further regulating the German economy. Uh, and she's a, you know, she's uh, supposed to be a conservative in their in their mm -hmm. system. So you wonder uh, if she couldn't have done more to uh, to to uh, reverse some of that. She has sort of put her money where her mouth is, certainly on the issue of Ukraine and Russia. Germany is Russia's largest trading partner, and it, at least publicly, it appears she's holding the line on demanding sanctions. Well, she is, but the question is, uh, what are sanctions really going to get? I mean, uh, Putin has. Uh, done what he's done, and I'm not sure the the sanctions. Are, I think they're just going to make everybody uh, worse off: the Germans, the Russians, the Ukrainians, everybody. So it's kind of everybody shooting each other in the head. So uh, sanctions, I guess you know, countries think they have to do something to show they're doing something when when Putin does something like this, like annex Crimea or, but, or but, monkey yeah, around in Ukraine. So, but these actually but, uh, these actually hurt Germany. I want to go back to something you said about her being seen as a conservative. She has given, for example, higher education. She has made that free now to most Germans. Uh, has she been pulled a little bit to the left? And does that account for what it, right now is overwhelming popularity? Yes, and I also think she's also increased pension uh, benefits as well. So she has not been uh, what, uh, what you would call a conservative in the United States or other countries. Uh, the, she has definitely done some very liberal things. I've been Elin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good talking with you. Ahead. You know, there are better ways to get to Bermuda than the way our favorite person of the day chose. You're going to meet him next on our Rise Exchange. Arise serves underserved communities by bringing them news, information, sports, and entertainment from places that are becoming part of the world economy, that are becoming a part of the world voice, and decisions that are affecting things in the world that people care about. They care about the economy. They care about safety and security. And if you come to Arise and you watch our broadcast, these are the things we're going to bring to you every day, 24 hours a day. There's certain news programs that have a Democrat and a Republican, and all they do is, here's the Democrat saying his side, and the Republican say, you know, it's a little debate show, but not everybody is a sort of an extremist on one side or the other. People are in the middle a lot more. Arise News, every culture, every angle. Time now for our favorite person of the day, when we pick one person who grabbed our attention, eh, not for the right reasons. We're all for adventure, but let's face it, when things don't go as planned, you come out looking rather silly. That's the case with marathon runner Reza Belushi, who decided to pedal his way from Miami to Bermuda in something called a hydropod. Look at that thing, which is basically an inflatable bubble. Well, guess what? It didn't go so well. Belushi had to be rescued about 80 miles off the coast of St. Augustine, Florida. When the Coast Guard got to him, he was disoriented and asked for directions to Bermuda, which was still 1,000 miles away. It's that way. <laughs> now, the bubble journal journey did start with the best of intentions. According to a website Belushi had set up, he had intended to raise money for children in need. And by the way, he does have quite a backstory. Belushi escaped Iran, where he says he was tortured. He rode a bike across 55 countries, then somehow made it across the Atlantic to the United States via Mexico in 2002. Still, the rough water of the Atlantic Ocean proved more daunting than escaping a tyrannical regime. And even though we like the guy and he's a bit of an eccentric, we are making Reza Belushi our favorite person of the day. Coming up, the greenwashing of America. Why some of your favorite products may not be so green after all when a rise exchange comes back. Informative, the U.S. economy is on the right path, and the wizard of the Fed 
is leading the way. We started our companies originally to create something that made a positive difference. Compelling. I became very successful. Not allowing myself to be average. Our favorite person of the day when we pick one person who grabbed our attention and not for the right reason. Yeah, he sort of lost All it. business. Investors came back from the long weekend tanned, rested, and ready to buy stocks. Entertaining Money Daily, a rise exchange. You know, it was Kermit who said being green is not easy, but it could be good for business, even if the business is not really green. Many companies are accused of duping unsuspecting customers out of millions of dollars each year by using words like natural, botanical, pure, and free, despite being full of harmful chemicals. It's called greenwashing, and it's big business in the United States. Our next guest says there are several steps consumers can take before purchasing a, quote, green product. Arthur Weissman is the CEO of Green Seal and the author of In the Light of Humane Nature, Human Values, Nature, the Green Economy, and Environmental Salvation. Arthur, welcome to Arise Exchange. Thank you very much. All right, why don't you de define for us what greenwashing is? Greenwashing is when a company makes a claim in its marketing about the environmental attributes of a product that are not really true or exaggerated or cannot be substantiated. Is also greenwashing, would you include things like carbon offsets when they're so nominal to a company's bottom line and that they, they say they do carbon offsets, for example? They're gonna plant that, a tree somewhere? Well, uh, yeah, one tree would be uh, <laughs> yeah. rather uh, uh, trivial, but um, I I if, it's, if it's actually a meaningful carbon offset, that would not be greenwashing. Mm -hmm. But if, in fact, that uh, the, the carbon output of a product is a trivial part of the environmental impact of that product, that would be greenwashing because that's not really where the impacts are. And clearly, consumers are becoming more educated about this, and they do generally want to buy environmentally friendly products. So can you give us a little bit of an overview of steps consumers can take uh, to know the products they're buying really are what they say they are? Well, I'd first qualify that. Okay. Some consumers really want to buy environmentally preferable products, greener products, more sustainable products. But for the most part, most consumers are not really still uh, paying attention to this. And that's part of the problem that I try to address in my book, In the Light of Humane Nature, that all of us as consumers really have to show more concern about this because it affects the health of our families, of ourselves, of other people and the health of our world on which we all depend. And so I think the first step for all consumers is to show concern to their retailers, to their favorite brand manufacturers, uh, to anyone in the economy that they deal with, that they really care about this because manufacturers really are reticent to go too far without knowing that the consumers really want them to go there. Okay, so let's say you made that decision. How do you make sure you're buying Okay, beyond that, the best thing is to look for a bona fide third-party certified environmentally preferable product, such as a Green Seal certified product. That's my organization that certifies environmentally preferable products and services. Now, in reality, when you look at the consumer market, there aren't that many products that have gotten that voluntary third-party seal of approval by Green Seal or comparable organizations. And so right now, it's uh, what the consumer has to do besides expressing their concern is to go to a retailer that is known for providing organic and more sustainable or green products uh, based basically on the reputation. And so, uh, so what, it, what does an organization like your group does? You basically look at the product and evaluate it to make sure the claims are true. And then what is the standard of those claims? Well, Green Seal uh, certifies products according to our standards, which are for specific categories of products or services. For example, uh, a cleaning product for a floor or, or for a general purpose, uh, uh, a floor polish. Uh, we also certify products as far re as uh, disparate as windows or paper products, from uh, tissue products to fine paper, uh, paints. Uh, we also certify services are, 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 like are, are, hotels have, and restaurants. We have less than a minute left, so I want to ask you yeah. about Coca-Cola and Walmart, two companies that were accused of greenwashing. What did they do wrong? Well, Green Seal is a nonprofit 
private sector program, uh, so we don't actually get involved in government actions. But in these cases, most likely, the, I'm not familiar with them specifically, but they probably uh, made claims, environmental claims, about their products or yeah, what they were selling. Up. Should the government get more? Be backed up. Should the government get more involved here? Do we need the government to step in, or is this simply a, a case of false advertising? Well, absolutely. It is a case of false advertising. That's why the Federal Trade Commission is involved. But it's a very small agency. It's really understaffed, and it can't take the really a uh, number of enforcement actions that are needed out there in the marketplace to make sure that these claims, these greenwashing claims, are, are not made anymore. All right. Arthur Weisman, the CEO of Green Seal and the author of In the Light of Humane Nature, Human Values, Nature, the Green Economy, Environmental Salvation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Tomorrow on Arise Exchange, an NBA record-breaking deal topping $24 billion. Why, it's poised to shake up the TV world. Let's take a look at the markets once again. Sort of a eh, meandering day for the markets. Red across the board, but not a huge sell-off. I'm Andrew Schmertz. That, thanks for watching. Arise Exchange, always a green program. See you tomorrow.